Hello and welcome to The Fix, a podcast about Photoshop, Lightroom, post-processing, and the cool and creative things we get to do with our images after the shoot. I'm your host, Sean Duggan, and on today's show, my guest is Carrie Bean, a professional retouching artist from New York City who specializes in digital retouching for fashion, beauty, and high-end product photography. We're going to take a look at some really cool examples of the type of retouching that Carrie is often hired to do, and she's also going to give us a peek behind the curtain and deconstruct one of her layered retouching files and show us some really cool and useful Photoshop tips for fashion and beauty retouching. Stay with us. Well, Carrie Bean, thanks so much for taking the time to join me on The Fix. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. And you are based in New York City, which I imagine is a, uh, a good place to be for the type of uh, high-end retouching work that you specialize in. Absolutely. I think this is the uh, main place to be, at least in the United States. Um, yeah, this is a good place to be, a good place to get started. Yeah. And, and so, uh, you know, on your website, um, which is carrynyc.com, um, it says that you specialize in digital photographic retouching for fashion, beauty, and high-end reproduction. And as we uh, we see some of the uh, of your work on your website, kind of in a slideshow uh, right now, obviously there's a lot of um, oh, there's Rihanna. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> obviously, there's a lot of you know high end beauty and fashion stuff. And, and so, is that the bulk of uh, of the work that you do? Give, give us a rundown of, of, you know, the, the type of projects you tend to work on. Yes, we work, we do high end, what we call high end retouching. We do cosmetic, a lot of hair clients, a lot of, uh, uh, well, not a lot of product, but we have a couple of high end uh, product clients that we do. It's nice change of pace from doing hair, which is very tedious, uh, can be very tedious as uh, more difficult retouching, but uh, uh, mainly uh, beauty, cosmetic, fashion, hair, and product. And um, and then the end use of these, I'm, I'm guessing uh, a lot of magazine uh, mainly, reproduction. Yes, mainly magazines. They'll be uh, uh, for commercial advertising in magazines and uh, billboards and the Rihanna ad I saw go by on a taxi, a New York city taxi the other day, which was fun. Yeah. Um, I'm used to seeing my stuff in the magazines and in light boxes, in store, uh, 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 imagery and, uh, but it's fun to see it go by on a taxi. So when you say light boxes, you mean kind of like a, a Dura Trans exactly back, um, a backlit display backlit display. They uh, they it's an it, it's uh, they use an RGB image to create those. So uh -huh. uh, yeah, so they're like a, a backlit from light RGB image. And, and so this is kind of a total diversionary question, but I'm going to ask it because I know if I don't ask it now, I'll forget about it. Um, so like when you when you hand off final files. Uh, to your client, are you handing off RGB or CMYK? I give both. Uh, we used to work in CMYK all the time in high-end uh, retouching studios. We we worked that way because it, that was the output because the stuff was all all of it was for print. There wasn't as much when I started. There wasn't as much stuff. Um, on the web as there is now people don't didn't share the the imagery as much uh you know like even on instagram for example when i did rihanna's ad as soon as i turned that ad over to her she she uh instagrammed the image hmm. so yeah so these days we work in rgb and then at the end i i uh create the, the final RGB TIFF, and then I make it a CMYK conversion and I give the client both. Mm -hmm. So there's two files for every image gets, they get uh, two finals, RGB and CMYK. 
Yeah, yeah. And and so how did you how did you get started in this uh fascinating oh realm <laughs> of, of retouching? Well, um I I was a painter. I studied painting. Uh, I went to the Kansas City Art Institute and um I was cruising through life doing a variety of other things when I needed to like uh, reinvent myself after living outside of the country for a long time. And somebody suggested that I do art on the computer, which I thought was the most ridiculous idea I had ever heard. <laughs> and uh, then a photographer friend of mine was doing, was using Photoshop and I was looking over his sh shoulder and I thought, Hmm, now that's interesting. So I got a copy of Photoshop and then forget about it. Everything was over except for that. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the, the first job that I got was a uh, in a color lab, like uh, f factory retouching. But mm -hmm. I knew I knew that was leading somewhere, and I realized that I wanted to do high end retouching. So I I kind of slaved away in that job for two years, like learning everything I could about not only Photoshop and and retouching but um printing print the printing process and profiles and all of the other stuff that goes along with it which is really really important for a, a retoucher to know yeah yeah you know my uh my first uh professional commercial experience with photoshop was was also in a color lab in a, in a photo lab a large regional photo lab mm -hmm. and um when i started out there that the this was in the mid 1990s so the lab was was still mainly an optical lab, printing from negatives and stuff like that. Uh, but we had film recorder devices. So what we would do is we would do our retouching, and then we would uh, output the digital file to film, be that a negative or a four by five transparency. <laughs> and then you know sometimes that was the, the deliverable. Sometimes we, it, we made further prints from those kind of digital negatives in the optical part of the lab. But you know, yes. It's it's, so it's now like we had a similar experience in our the way we started out. Yeah, and it has changed so much. Even I actually didn't. I actually started in two thousand. So mm. yeah, and and when I came back, I, I I lived in a third world country, and when I came back to the United States, I didn't even know how to turn on a computer. <laughs> Literally in two thousand, I knew nothing about computers, and so yeah. Yeah, 15 years, 16 years later. Well, when we started, when I was doing it, when we started, you know, that was, um, it, it was a service offered by this photo lab. And at that point in time, very few photographers themselves were doing Photoshop stuff. And when I started, it was photo, Photoshop 3. So Photoshop had just uh, gotten layers. It had just gotten layers. Um, yeah, that, that was a good one to start with. I started yeah. on I started on three also, but it wasn't the m most up to date software. I got it, and then as soon as I started playing with it, I realized, oh, this is something I really it needs. So I went out and got myself of uh, five was what uh, Photoshop five was the one I started on. It was the newest that that was out at that time. Mm, yeah. So um, so uh, you know like uh like everybody does you know you start with the software you start doing stuff and then but you knew fairly early on from your experience in this color lab it sounds like that you were uh interested in in doing the the more high-end retouching it took me a while to even realize that there there that was a thing mm -hmm. but i mean when i first started using photoshop i didn't realize that that was a, a career direction at all or that was a, a thing you know but once i got into the color lab i you know was really fixated with Photoshop. Uh, one thing that I did that was really, really a good move on my part was uh, I went to, actually, that's where I met you for the first time with <laughs> Giggle. Uh, in, uh, where was it? Lost at the, the, um, the Photoshop World Convention, right? Oh, right. I think that was in San Diego. Was it? San yeah, I keep thinking it was Los Angeles for some reason. It, it, yeah, it, it was either that or it was either L.A. or San Diego. But it was, yeah, it was Southern I think California. It was L.A. because it was near the um, Staples Center. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. You're right. right. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that and, and and anyway, so I went to that and I learned a lot uh, taking those uh, various different classes, and I was so so into it. I mean, mm -hmm. I was a Photoshop 
nerd. Like I just couldn't get enough of it. <laughs> I'm sure, we've all been Photoshop nerds at one point or another. I, I'm, and, and of course, we still are. <laughs> we we still are. But that was a that was a really fun time because I knew enough about Photoshop not to get lost in it. You know, mm -hmm. not to be overwhelmed anymore, but I, I needed to n learn new tricks. And, and at once it was the kind of thing that it wasn't out there as easy to find it as it is now on the Internet. Uh, yeah. So if going to Photoshop World, you learned all these tips and tricks, uh, so-called tricks that uh, you just couldn't find easily elsewhere. Uh, right. Now, yeah. Now there's too much stuff out there because uh People go on, on, you know, everybody and their brother's a, a high in Photoshop uh, uh, retouch teacher, mm -hmm. but they're teaching poor technique. And, and that's the problem with people going out doing tutorials online is to decipher between what's a high end technique and what's a, you know, hmm. <laughs> terrible technique <laughs> i was yeah, searching yeah. for a nice word to <laughs> <laughs> you're, like, you're trying to be diplomatic <laughs> for example uh yeah, in the last uh, the last three to five years all of a sudden everybody's using frequency separation yeah i know that's like that's like the total buzzword you hear all the time and it's the most horrible technique in my opinion in the world i mean maybe 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 somebody if they do it just exactly right can get away with it but it creates fake looking texture it it if they do it wrong it's completely blurred um, i have an example of it on my desktop i've i i i will show you because i've been advertising for uh uh freelancers to come work here with me mm -hmm. And uh, so I get a lot of applications with like just the craziest before and afters. And I said on my ad, no filters on the skin. The only <laughs> way to do high end skin is uh, some healing and cloning and dodge and burn, mm -hmm. dodge and burn, no frequency separation, no filters, no blurring, but I know it takes longer, but we get paid by yeah. the hour here, you know? <laughs> yeah, there you go. That's good. That's good. <laughs> and, and so in, in your, um, in your work that you do, you're, you're working for, uh, are you working d uh, directly with photographers who need you to do the retouching or with ad agencies, uh, uh, designers? What, what's the, 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 the typical sort of client relationship? So I work for photographers and I work for, um, ad agencies. And I also work for um, directly for companies. Like I have a hair company that I uh, work for and the one of the three owners of the uh, hair company does all the photography for the company as well. And I work directly for hmm. him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so the company <laughs> like um, Paul Mitchell is also one that I work for. Um, so I work for actually the Paul Mitchell company. It's the art director within that company that calls me and gives me the job. Uh, Aquage and Bio, uh, Biomega. I also work directly for that company and their art directors. And so um, I imagine that in this business that uh, the word of mouth is probably uh, a lot of how you built your, your clientele uh, initially. Yes, absolutely. You, you know, cold calling people does, I, in my experience, just n never works. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm in the beginning, I tried a lot of that and, uh, you know, I tried a lot of different things to market myself, but um, really in the end, uh, the only way that I've gotten clients is from uh, word of mouth. I did get one big client who saw me speaking at the Photo Plus convention. So you can, uh -huh. be, you, that's one way you can market yourself is you can teach it, uh, which I get a lot yeah. of recognition because I teach uh, uh, workshops at the uh, School of Visual Arts. And of course, I wrote a book that got me some attention. And um, I speak every year at the Photo Plus convention. So that does give me a little notoriety as well. But other than that, it's, it's mainly through just word of mouth and people suggesting me that have used me before. Right, right. And, and so, you know, for 
you know, w when you first start out uh, in in Photoshop, of course, there there's there's certain tools you gravitate to right away, um, and, and one of those, uh, uh, for better or for worse, a lot of times for worse, <laughs> uh. is the the clone stamp tool. Uh, you know, people have a lot of fun with that right away. I know that I did <laughs> when I was right. first starting out, adding multiple eyes to people and doing strange, <laughs> surreal things. Right. It's fun. Um, yeah, it, it, it is fun, but it, easy to do a lot of damage and make your picture look much worse than it ever started out as. So, uh, yes. you know, in terms of, um, you know, kind of common things that, that you see that are, uh in, in terms of retouching um that are uh kind of done it, it, i don't know if i want to use the word wrong but you know sloppily or, or you know common pitfalls that people fall into can can you think of any that that come to mind in terms of oh i can think of advice to pass on i can think of many 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 <laughs> but the, the the first and the biggest one for me is um not knowing how to set your brush settings. Well, one thing I always say in my classes is that, uh, okay, you open up a brand new copy of Photoshop and you grab your brush tool and you just start painting uh, or you grab your clone stamp tool and you just start cloning. But yeah. what if, what if, so the, uh, the setting is going to be the Photoshop def default setting, right? Mm -hmm. it, right? That's what yeah. it will be because there's a million literally probably a million settings that ways that you can set your brush up to work and your clone stamp tool, yeah. right? Um, so why would you just use the default setting? You don't even know what the default setting is, right? It, it, what if it were, if mm -hmm. the default, yeah. if the default brush was set up to a four leaf clover brush, would you just leave it like that? <laughs> Right. No. Well, you'd certainly you'd certainly notice it right away. <laughs> you certainly would. So uh, one of the bi biggest parts of the like almost the first whole entire morning of one of my workshops is just talking about the brush tool, the brush panel and how it works and what it does. Like, you know, you have opacity and you have flow. What's the difference? And um, mm -hmm. what are the differences in the, br the brush panel, uh, the different ch check boxes that you can check and what do they do? So uh, I, I go into great detail uh, about that in my workshops. So that's one of the first main things that I see because people are struggling to do stuff that they're, they're having to work harder to get something that, that, that they want than they have to because they have the wrong settings on their brush. Like dodge and burn, for example, you need to have a very delicate brush. And that doesn't mean just dropping your opacity way down. I don't use opacity, by the way. Uh, that would probably be what most people would think to do is just drop your opacity way down low. But just doing that is not going to give you a good dodge and burn brush. And so I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that the reason you're not using opacity is that you find it's easier to control with a, uh, the stylus. Is that it? No, 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 that's not it at all. It is, uh, uh, opacity, um, is just a matter of tone and not, it, it also doesn't, it also, it also doesn't work well with the stylus. You're right. But that, that's not why, because first off I use, I, I keep the opacity all the way up at hundred percent and I click on my airbrush tool, which automatically uh, switches your, your function from opacity to flow. So I use flow right. to go up and down and uh, to, you know, uh, I use flow and then I take the uh, flow from, you know, from 2% all the way to hundred percent, depending on what it is I'm doing. So uh, w while we're on the subject of flow, cause that, that question comes up a, a lot. Um, let's clarify for people what flow is because opacity, I think is fairly easy for, for most people to understand. That's just sort of the level of translucency, translucency, or, or how much you can see through the brush stroke or, or layer or whatever. I think most people get that, but flow um, uh, kind of trips people up. How would you define what flow is? Flow, 
flow works more like an actual airbrush, right? Mm -hmm. So if you if you if you were painting with an airbrush, um, so you say so you've got an airbrush and you're painting. So the faster you go, the the less paint is going to be able to go in that area. Or, you know, it, the, if you go faster, you're gonna uh, you're gonna let down less paint than if you take with a slow hand. Right. And it, it works right. exactly like that. You go faster in one area, uh, the, the, uh, there'll be less paint laid down. And if you slow your hand down, the, the paint's coming out at an even steady flow. Right. Exactly. Flow. So if you yeah. slow your hand down, so basically you could get a, a more transparent um, layer of paint if you go fast and if you slow down, you can get a thicker uh, paint all the way to black. If you go, if you keep going back and forth over the same area, you can go from, uh, you know, almost transparent to completely black and just without lifting up your pen from the, from the tablet. Okay. And, and, and so would you, would you equate the going slower to a higher flow or a lower flow set? Well, it, it, no matter what, where you have your flow, that's going to be the case faster or, or, or slower. Yeah. But, but when you take the, when you take the flow down, it's like, uh, actually on the airbrush on an actual physical airbrush like lowering how much paint is actually coming out at any given time if you have it all up the way up to 100 it's like going to shoot out maximum paint but if you lower the flow down lower then that mm -hmm. it, then there's less paint that's being sprayed out it works right. exactly like that right right and then when yeah, you that, have you can work with flow without having the airbrush on but i always have the airbrush on and the difference is that if you're if you're painting on your tablet and then you just come to a complete stop but you're still holding your stylus to the tablet the the flow will stop painting there the 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 if you just have flow on it'll stop painting if you don't move your hand anymore but if you have airbrush on and you stop and hold continue to hold your your pen to the tablet it will continue to paint yeah just like like if you had for, for those people who haven't used an airbrush if you if you hold the plunger or the button down on a can of spray paint it's just going to keep shooting paint out exactly right yeah, yeah. you can think of it as a yes you know, it's basically the same thing as you know like a can of spray paint or or an airbrush kind of work the same way and, and then just to clarify for for people what we're referring to is that when you have a brush tool active in photoshop in the options bar uh, right after the flow setting, there is a little airbrush option that you can enable that behavior. And so that's what Carrie has been referring to. Yeah, I can point that out when we go to the desktop. Yeah. Well, let, let's take a look at some of those before and after um, examples that you have set up that give us an idea of, of some of the work that you do. Okay, so um, here's an example, just to show some examples of the kind of things that we are asked to do. Um, this is kind of a file from quite some time ago and uh, it's pretty retouched in the end but uh one of the things that they asked me to do here was they gave me this file and asked me to remove the rain <laughs> so they were, they were they were spritzing the model with with water there to get that effect i'm guessing yeah right exactly so she uh and as you can see if i zoom in just a little bit you can see that she is you can see all the little blue water uh, raindrops being yeah, uh, splattered yeah, on, on her. her. So on her. Uh, my first reaction, and this was a long time ago, I think today I would probably just go, oh, gosh, and, and not be you know, like, OK, that's work. But uh, back then I thought, oh, my God, how was I going to do it? Because this this was quite some time ago. But uh, so I just got started and took the rain off. Huh. Right. So. Um, so you're working on a duplicate layer, obviously, for, for, for uh, that. Yeah, you, as you can see over here, I have this all simplified down just it to for um, showing before and afters and so on. But it was mainly uh, color work. Let me just turn that on and off a couple of times. Uh, mainly just color work and um, cloning and dodging and burning. And when I use my clone stamp tool, I don't just, this is a, interesting fym because i'm very particular about the the clone uh the the brush settings for brush and clone etc but as you'll notice when i just hit my clone step tool the mode up here was set in, set to lighten 
apparently from something that I was doing earlier this morning. Um, because when I use my clone stamp tool, I most often I'm going to be using either the light and blending mode or the dark and blending mode. And that's those two blending modes are what I use when I do my skin cloning. So there's um, less chance of uh, do destructive, doing destructive things to my image. It just makes it easier to be less destructive because clone stamping is destructive no matter what, mm -hmm. but uh, it's less troublesome if you use these two blending modes I've found. Yeah, yeah, no, those are definitely very handy. Yes. And uh, so I'll just a little bit. So once I took the rain off, they're like, okay, great. So now I want you to make your, their, uh, make her hair dry. <laughs> Man, they just couldn't stop, huh? No. I was like, what? But uh, of course, nowadays, I've, since that time, I've put hair from one shot onto another shot a million times. So mm -hmm. uh, what uh, they provided me with uh, five or six other selects w when her hair was dry earlier and um, I just chose pieces from those shots and warped it onto her head too. And this was Photoshop uh, back a ways. We didn't, it was harder for me to get the hair on there because we didn't have the, the warp tool the way we have now. Mm -hmm. and we, we had free, tra free transform, but not warp. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Warp is, is a, uh, very useful tool. Oh yeah, I use it constantly, constantly, every day, every day, every day. Of course. Um, so, another example of interesting things that we get asked to do is is too zoomed in there. Uh, fix hairlines. Hmm. A lot of times the girls are wearing wigs. Yeah, why don't you zoom in, zoom, zoom in a little bit closer so we can see that, that wig line there. Yeah. Because that's where all the action is. Oh, yeah, uh, obvious wig. This one's really obvious. But they're, done, they're not usually that obvious, but mm -hmm. apparently they just figured, oh, let Carrie fix it. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and they said they wanted to keep the dark roots. And so, um, hmm. and I did that by pulling different parts of hair and just uh, masking it in. And I used a lot of high pass, um, which is a filter that helps to sharpen things and also allows you to pick up pieces of texture. I think I could show you quickly how you can pick up a piece of texture from one place and put it into another. If I just lasso that little piece of that little area of hair right there. Yeah. And then, and then I'm just going to hit, hold the command key down or control if you're on a PC and hit the J key, which will pop that up on a layer by itself over here, makes a new layer of it. And then I go to filter other uh, high pass. And then probably about something between on a high uh, on a high resolution file, something between eight and nine is probably about right. Uh, just click OK. And as you see it now, it looks funny. But what I do is I just set this to eat soft light. And then I just tap the V keys to get my move tool and drag the. Now you see that I have the actual texture of that hair, but on a transparent layer so that I just have the texture. Oh, oh right, yeah, because the, uh, the gray areas created by the high pass filter are being hidden by the soft light blend mode. The soft light blend mode, exactly. It's just like a, a high, um, high pass is basically a 50% gray layer uh, set, uh, if you set a 50% gray layer to soft light, it will become invisible. Right. So basically, this is a 50% gray layer with that uh, that image information embedded into it, both the highs and the lows, the darks and the lights. So therefore, the darks be become visible and the lights become visible, therefore giving you a piece of texture that you can. So if I have a soft area in the hair and I need to add more texture in, I can 
get the transform tool there and just turn it mm. so I can add detail. You know, those Pantene ads or those Darnier Nutrice ads where they have the big long hair. No, they're, you're never going to get a shot that has hair that is perfectly in detail all the way down. So this, right. is, this is how we do it. Ah, uh, interesting. We take detail from one area and put it into an, uh, another area that, that needs detail. So you can do that with skin or a multitude of things. Yeah, yeah. Fabrics no, that are missing, uh, you know, if you, had to, if you had to overwork a fabric like, where you were like removing a wrinkle and mm -hmm. you, end, you end up getting it kind of smudgy, soft, you can yeah. take texture from another area of that, uh, that garment and high pass that texture and put it onto the area that you smudged up. Oh, excellent. Excellent. No, that's, that, that's a great tip. You know, what I love about this is that, you know, um, we all kind of, uh, you know, once we get proficient at Photoshop, we, you know, uh, kind of work in our kind of our grooves or our tracks that we've chosen to work in, you know, like I do a lot of, of, uh, for want of a better word, fine art photography, and then also compositing where I'm doing, you know, intricate multiple image composites. Mm -hmm. So I know, uh, the use for, uh, a lot of these techniques as it pertains to the type of work that I do, but like, that's a totally new use for the high pass filter that I really hadn't thought about because I don't do, you know, this sort of, you know, beauty or, or fashion retouching. So that's very cool. Right. We use it a lot in, 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 in the, in retouching. That's I couldn't live without my high pass. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> All right. What about, what else do we got in there? In your bag of tricks there. My bag of tricks. Well, you were just talking about um, compositing. So let's look at a composite image. Uh, this was fun. Um, here was the original. And you'll see that this guy's face, this guy behind the, the uh, candles, uh -huh. uh, this girl's head, I believe, this little guy back here, all of them have been swapped out. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. yeah and of course the, the candles are, are, uh, flaming quite a lot. Oh, right. And I, yes, <laughs> good point. Oh, I, I see. I, it's, so, oh, I see the guy is blowing the flames on the guy with the candle. I get it. Right. He, he, he was, I, I was at the actual photo shoot for this. I'm not always at the shoots myself, but I was mm -hmm. at this one and, uh, we shot, uh, the flame blower guy, uh, with of course with everybody else gone from the table and he was actually he was a flame blower and he oh, okay yeah he was actually we we removed everybody from the set and all the uh drapery so we didn't catch <laughs> the place on fire and he blew uh he had you know gasoline in his mouth and he blew f fire several times and we shot it and then i t took those pieces and um dropped them in of course so let me ask you a question here. This is kind of my my compositing artist uh, diving in here for a question. Uh, but when you are on set like that, uh, and and you know kind of what the concept for the shoot is going to be, uh, are you ever uh, uh, asked for you know input on? Well, hey, Carrie, you know, uh, is there something we can do that's going to make your end result compositing easier or? or whatever you know so so how often does uh your retouching artist input get factored into the actual shoot a lot actually um i was the photographer wanted me on this shoot so that i could tell him what what i might need uh we did a few shots of um some of these performers individually and they they had products in their hand and so uh, or jewelry on their fingers one guy was holding like some sort of a martini type thing and he had rings on his fingers so i i had the photographer go in <clears throat> excuse me go in and shoot the hand and the glass so that it, and, and the jewelry of course on his fingers so that i could drop that in for a sharper piece oh i see then if you shot him full body then I wouldn't, you know, the hand and the jewelry wouldn't be sh as sharp as we wanted it. So we shot it closer so I could comp it in. I see. Yeah. Interesting. 
yeah. So that's and what, what was what was this image for? Just out of curiosity, it was an editorial for um, this. This girl had a cookbook, and there was uh -huh. an article in a in Elle magazine uh, uh -huh. about about her, and the uh, it was shot at this uh, club not too far from me here in the East Village. Uh, it was a it was a super hot uh, club at the time that had like a burlesque show mm -hmm. that they that they did. And these were all the performers. It was in a really cool little, uh, old building, uh, old theater building over on Christie street. Yeah, no, it looks, it looks great. It's yeah, always it great to work with, with performers, you know, cause the, the costumes and they're, they're really good at getting into the whole scenario. Exactly. They, they're all actors and actresses and performers. So yeah, it was a lot of fun. Cool. And so talking about, um, skin, Uh, so basically, um, dodge and burn, uh, clone stamp tool on light and darken, and the healing brush. I, I used to tell people not to use the healing brush, but it has gotten better in the last couple of years. So the, the last iteration or two of Photoshop, there's been kind of a discussion that it got bad again. Some people were complaining it wasn't working right. And it was having some problems, but I think actually it seems to be fixed now from... So I do use it, uh, but I, you know, you have to use your eye and be careful if it's doing something funky to your image. I've seen people who do their, they do a whole retouch and they just, they just heal everything. And then afterwards, it's just a smudgy mess. It's, you know. Yeah. And the other, the other thing that I see people doing a lot of times in, you know, in training situations where I'm doing workshops or even, you know, one-on-one -on -one training is that somebody will, will do something with either the clone stamp tool or the healing brush or whatever, and it will result in, in something that they, that they see is, is not good. You know, it's obviously a problem, but the mistake that they make is instead of just undoing it, they, they try, try to, to they try to go over it again. Right. <laughs> and fix the mistake, which usually makes it work. It's like, wait a minute, you just undo it. <laughs> just yeah. go back, get rid of it. it. In my class, I'm always like, the people are sitting sort of sideways from their, their uh, keyboard and their screen. And one mm -hmm. hand is down in their, you, you have to retouch with both hands, shoulders square to your screen. One hand is on the keyboard and the other hand is holding your pen. Cause you know, constantly when, when I'm cloning, com, you know, command Z, if I, if, if it's no good, I can command Z in like less than one second and, yeah. and I'm, you know, at it again. So, so here's the before. And on this particular one, this is like a really crazy, I love this image, but the, it, this one was really crazy. She had um, black makeup on her, which was exaggerating the bumps uh -huh. and so on. So it was quite a difficult retouch. And I had to smudge up some stuff because there were areas that were just, um, you know, I just had to put too much elbow grease into it to get it where I needed it. So I, I high pass some texture from place to place to get a more even texture. The cool thing about high passing skin texture, it's, you know, it's a lot of people just put noise in there if they have a soft spot, but noise looks digital. That's just, a, I mean, it, it is digital. It's a computer yeah. generated uh, texture. But if you, if you use high pass to take a, te a good, good skin texture and put it someplace where you need it, it's real organic texture. Mm -hmm. So that's why I love well, it. Well, and the, the other thing about adding digital noise, I mean, it has its place in some situations, but what right. I found is that you often have to, at a later stage, add the same level of noise to the entire image just so that everything has, you know, a consistent level. Exactly, because if you go in and, you know, you zoom in. My, I always tell my students there was one time I was uh, 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 over in the Flatiron District where the Mac store is. Uh, yeah. Mac, Mac Cosmetics, and I came around the corner. I was thinking to myself, I was in my head, and I came around this corner, and I didn't even realize where I was at. And I looked up, and uh, there was a ten-foot-tall face-only retouch of mine hanging in the window, <laughs> and my stomach went bloop, 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 because I thought, oh, oh my God, they, I, you know, like I know they're going to make the the stuff that big sometimes, right. and, and bigger, but to see it printed that big, I, I thought, oh gosh. So I like stood there for the longest um, looking for mistakes. And of course there were none. 
<laughs> because I use the right techniques. Right, right. Yeah, well, that's the that's the thing. You know, um, when something is printed large, um, it, it will show any any, any retouching boo boos. That's the te technical term, boo boos. Yeah, and that's why you didn't used to use the healing brush. And I am careful about it even now when I'm doing like a cosmetic cosmetics job like that. Yeah. But, but yeah, because back then at the time that that Mac was done, if I had been using the healing brush, which I wasn't at all period on that image, um, it would have been seen because if you zoom in closely and you do the healing brush, you can see that it, at least it used to like make a little s storm of pixels. It looked like you look at all the pixels and they have like a uniform sort of um, texture and mm -hmm. like when you're really super zoomed in, but then you click with a clone stamp tool, it looks like a cyclone or a tornado, like hit right there and swirled up the, the pixels. Yeah. You, you could really see it, especially if things were blown up. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's really the acid test, you know, to uh, mix, mix metaphors there. But um, yeah, when, when things are printed that large, boy, the, the retouching has to, has to hold up. Or, or the compositing, you know, whatever it is you've done to it. Exactly, of course. Anytime you're moving pixels around, you've got to uh, double double check and use the right techniques. Uh, just to point out, I was talking about the, the brush, um, by the way. Uh, so here's my brush. And as you can see right here, I have airbrush on. Um, for every tool, I have it turned on. Like if I go to the clone stamp tool, the airbrush is turned on. I'm using flow. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, even uh, the this is the eraser tool. They changed the little icon so you can barely tell that that's an eraser tool if you ask me. But OK. <laughs> uh, right. Um, so you can see um, and um, I'm using my keyboard to change my tools. Even the history brush, you've got the. Uh, even the, on. Yeah. OK. Um, so just to talk about the different brushes that you might be using. Um, I'll, I'll just give this one tip. I'm not going to go into my huge, long uh, spiel about how to set up brushes, of course, here. But one very important thing, this is the brush tool. Normally, when you open up Photoshop for the first time, this little thing right here called Shape Dynamics is on. Mm -hmm. And it creates a very weird brush. And I'm not going to go through my demo, but just suffice to say, you should, you know, look into that. Um, I go in and turn it off for every tool. It's, it will be on for everything, for every single tool. Eraser, um, eraser, uh, um, brush tool clone, all, any brush type tool that that shape dynamics will be on and it creates a very weird brush you may find that if your clone step tool will work so much better if you just turn that off oh, okay okay good to know yeah it's very good to know so uh, the only time i use this is when i'm making specialty brushes which if i come up here and open up my brushes here are my preset brushes that i've made for my work um mm -hmm. okay like for example if i uh, grab i think this one you'll go in and see this is a, a brush that i use to create hair strokes um you can see that shape dynamics is turned on because in shape dynamics you click on the word you get the options for it uh you can get a jitter because if you look at the little preview i don't know if you guys can see that here but it's it instead of having one smooth brush it gets it has like a jitter to it and when i uh, use this brush it's for hair and especially for things like eyelashes and i'm gonna just swoosh this out i have two monitors here i keep my panels on one monitor and just put that back because i need to have that brush panel open at all times to see what brush because it has that little preview so i can see what brush i have real quick just by glancing so do i need to change my brush oh yeah i got an eyelash brush and i want to dodge and burn so i need to change it right mm -hmm. so i these eyelashes were created right here's oh. the, is what do i i drew the eyelashes with an eyelash brush with the shape wow they, they look incredibly convincing oh thank you yeah 
I mean, everything looks incredibly convincing because, you know, on, on that picture there, there's just so much, uh, you know, really kind of tactile, you know, visible, discernible skin texture there. And I'm sure a lot of that's coming from, you know, also the makeup that's on her as well. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, very cool. Thank you. Okay, so shall we dissect this? Yeah, let, let's, let's finish off by uh, having a little deconstruction of that image. Um, I think it's really uh, a good learning tool to just uh, deconstruct someone's, fi someone's actual file. I mean, to be honest, really, that's how I learned most of my stuff. Most of what I know was by working in an actual high-end studio and looking at other, you know, like looking through and th thumbing through, so to speak, uh, 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 another retoucher's uh, layers yeah. you know, to see how did they do it. Yeah, um, so I, uh, I have a Facebook retouchers group that I um, admin together with the creator of the uh, group. Um, so periodically i um may leave comments and help with critique and stuff there so uh, this was a, a photographer who gave his raw files for people to play with and somebody had done something to it and we got in a discussion about it so i finally decided i was grab this image and do it as a, a just a learning tool so this wasn't a real job so that's why i have it basically layered up so that we could because typically I would um, merge some of this stuff, but I'll just start from the beginning. Um, so normally I would not have the raw conversion underneath, mm -hmm. but, but I just have it here just so you can see. This would be a Photoshop raw conversion if I just didn't set any of the settings. I didn't change anything. I just accepted the default uh, settings in Photoshop raw. Okay. Is it possible to zoom up maybe one level on that just to yeah. sort of see? Yeah. Yeah, there we go. That way we can see, because I am I know you, you're probably uh, have done lots of great jobs smoothing out the skin on this one. Uh, yeah, there's some intricate uh, work on this one. Uh, so this was, uh, and this is, so far we're talking about color here, because the first thing that I did was, um, so, so this was if I just accepted Photoshop's decision for my raw conversion color, I would mm -hmm. get, I would start from that. But instead I tweaked the color in raw. And this was how I set up my color to, for, for my begin, my beginning layer, my background, basically. Um, I did two conversions because I did one for the skin tone and I did another one to pull this hair out because the, it, the, the conversion, conversion for the skin was uh, losing the hair. So I did a second conversion and blended them together so that the hair popped out a little better. You can see that. Yeah. Okay. So then I, so I started with this color instead because I wanted to kind of go for ice queen here. Um, right. So then the, the, the next layer is my retouching. I'm going to pop in one more so we can just look at the face. Yeah. Um, so uh, this layer would be healing and cloning only. Right. So it would be healing and cloning only just the more egregious spots like right. the, the the places that are too light to be able to dodge and burn or the mm -hmm. the, the areas that are too dark to to dodge and burn okay so then then i got to there um i'm not sure what this oh uh there was a little if i zoom at the end you can see this better there was a soft spot right here so i i high passed some texture into it Oh, okay. All right. I see. Okay. And we can look at that at the end so you can kind of see the difference, but that's just where it is in the layers deck. And this is a color blend of some sort. We'll look at that later. And then the lashes, I drew the lashes in. Oh, I, probably yeah. did, I probably did that uh, last, but that just happened to be where it's at. In the, right. Wow. Those are amazingly convincing eyelashes. Thank you. I have, I have practiced. <laughs> yeah, sure. Pra practice does make better and sometimes it, perfect. Yeah, you absolutely have to. Uh, this is something that you you don't learn to do in a weekend. Uh, OK, so this is I'll just turn all of them on and off at the same time. 
this is my dodge and burn. Uh, the lips, I'll just show you the, that's just a, basically it's a dodge layer, but I just enhanced the shine on her lips, just a tiny tweak right there. And, and let me just clarify for people who may be listening to the audio version here that, uh, that when Carrie is saying a dodge and burn layer, she's not actually referring to the dodge and burn tools. She is using mm -hmm. curves adjustment layers with layer masks to achieve the lightening and or darkening effect that would, would uh, that she's uh, referring to as dodge and burn. Exactly. When, when I say dodge and burn, there are actual, uh, there are uh, three dodge and burn techniques that I know of that are used in high end retouching in a high end studio. If you're, if you're working at a high end retouching studio here in New York city, you would be either uh, dodging and burning Basically, we, we call it that, although uh, I use curves and one one of the layers, uh, one is to lighten and one is to darken. So the lighten layer, of course, is do is dodging. This comes from the analog photography times when they would actually dodge and burn the light by. You know, that technique I'm not going to go into, but it's right, right, yeah. it's the term that that they used uh, to either let light hit or, or let light not hit the image when they were um, processing it. Uh, so, yeah. And then also there's the 50 percent gray layer that you can paint on with white and black. And that's also considered dodging and burning because you're you're darkening some areas and you're lightening some other areas. OK, so I'm I'm going to just turn on all my uh, dodge and burn layers together so you can see what happens. Hmm. Wow, that's significant. Right. So I'll turn them all off. Okay, so this is just curves. So this is totally non-destructive. All this work was just done with curves. And layer masks. With layer masks. And, and, and I'll just go through these one at, one at a time. I'll stop at the, I'll start at the, I'll do the darkened layer. It's at the very bottom, but I'll turn that one on last. So, cause usually what I'll do is I'll do my first light layer and you can see here's the curve. This is what the curve looks like. I just lightened. Um, by the way, yours, if you do it with an RGB image, it will look like that. Right. Uh, reason being that I learned retouching uh, by uh, working CMYK in, in CMYK. And a CMYK curve is upside down from an RGB curve. Right. And so you have your you have your curve uh, options set to exactly show, show pigment rather than light. Exactly, that's exactly yeah. right. And the where you do that is right here, uh, uh, curve dis display options. Right. So you can change it right there. Uh, so this this is the curve. I just lighten it a very tiny bit because you don't want to do a, a d your dodge and burn in one single layer. You know, if I were to pull that curve like really really far it will begin to um give me colored discoloration okay mm -hmm. so i'll turn on the first one there there was one then i did another one same thing same curve i actually have an action set up so that i hit my f1 key just totally makes uh, a layer like this uh fills it the mask with black so that the the effect is not showing and names the layer. So just in one second, by hitting the F1 key, I can get one of these dodge layers. Obviously I use a gazillion of them a day. Yeah. And, and then here's the next one. And then as you see, like once I do my dodging, you can see there's a couple of little spots in here that are too light. So I wanna blend the tones. So then I did my darkened layer. Huh. Amazing. Yeah, you know, a lot of people, I, I'm sure when they think of retouching, initially they think of things like the, you know, the clone stamp, the healing brush, spot healing brush, you know, those sorts of quote unquote retouch tools. But so much of, uh, you know, beauty and fashion glamour retouching is uh, accomplished by adjustment layers and masks. Absolutely. The more you can, the more you can rely on the adjustment layers, the better, because yeah. those are the non-destructive things that can be adjusted as well. Mm -hmm. um, so if, uh, as you see, this is a curve that has a mask attached to it. So if I, uh, if I hold the option key down, 
I can turn on the mask so I can see what it looks like. So that's what this this uh, Dodge mask looks like. This curves mask looks right, like. Right. And then. Yeah, those so, masks. Those masks look cool just on their own. Yeah, they they can be pretty weird looking sometimes. Uh, yeah. So this and that's another one. So basically, you get a a lot of bang for your buck there. And so I only in in this particular from there to there is one dark layer and three lighten layers. Uh huh to pretty much finish it off and she's got and I'm, I'm keeping texture reality you know looks looks real mm -hmm. okay and then i had a little thing to pop the the gold of her nose ring and her earring uh-huh and then on top is my my color corrections and this is before color and after, let me, so you can see yours. So when you look at the before, you can notice that the, really what you're attracted to is the hand because it's so light, mm -hmm. right? It's a, it's a big distraction because it's so much wider and lighter than the face. So yeah. I, I changed, I swapped that around so that the, the, the lightness of the face is more and then darken the hand down a bit. Right. Yeah. And took some of the heat out of her. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then at the very top, I had a, um, I added a grain layer, which is 50% gray layer with noise. We were talking about earlier and I put a yeah. little noise on it and then put a little slight blur on the, on the noise. That's just your generic, uh, yeah. uh, grain 101. Right. Because, uh, uh, you know, we mentioned earlier that, that when you add digital noise, it tends to look very digital. And, and part of the reason it looks quote unquote digital is that it's this very hard edge defined uh, noise pattern. And by softening it down ever so slightly with a, a very faint blur, you can mask very, that a bit. Right. And it looks a little bit more like actual, uh, photo you know, uh, film grain, which, right, is what, yeah. which is what you want. I like it. <laughs> Not every image, but I like some of these images. There's been a few that came out in the last year. I saw some Vogue ads of it was was it Dior ads uh, that had was heavy on the grain, and I thought it looked really nice on purpose. So they, yeah. So they were using grain more as a as a as a a creative uh, look. Yeah, yeah. They were they were going leaning heavy on the grain on purpose. I thought it looked really nice. I mean, it's not right. something you want to do for every single image. And sure, yeah. kind of an interesting thing is that at the top here, I have like a vis, what we call a, a, a visualization layer. It does help me. If you look at her chest, for example, yeah, it really brings up the little, uh, you know, it's like if, if you can't, if you're unable to see very well and you need to exaggerate the, 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 the dark stuff that you need to dodge away you can put a visualization layer at the top just to help you see and, and so that visualization layer just to clarify for for people who might be listening it's a black and white adjustment layer and you are adjusting the sliders to accentuate any uh yeah, just drag the irregularities down. in so the skin yeah. there are different ways of doing that black and white one because some people say that this is not the best way i mean i, I don't usually use a vis very often very rarely because i mean i've just trained myself to be able to see and on top of it you have to be a little careful with a vis you might over retouch because you see too much and and so how would you then use that layer it, it's primarily for visualization so you use it to point out oh i need to go do a little bit more work in that area that is that how you're using it right it's exactly it's just to see because it 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 intensifies those um dark patchy areas in her chest that makes it just makes it easier for you to see so you know where you need to dodge a little further right right um, also sometimes i'll just put a curve which is also pretty good just to, just set a curve and uh right oh dark. i see just gonna yeah and just leave dark. it dark up there and that way it that accentuates those areas too and it's maybe not quite as drastic as that very as very that cool black and white yeah 
Yeah, I know. Very cool. Yeah, this is just a simple one. I, I figured this was, this is not a, like a finished, finished beauty uh, image, but I think good for first round. Yeah, no, no, it's cool. No, a lot of really interesting techniques there and uh, uh, happy as, as a fan of adjustment layers and layer masks. I'm happy to see lots of those there. <laughs> oh, for sure. For sure. Yeah, now, yeah. Like I said, this is a simple one. When we get into other images, you know, I have many, 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 many layers. Mm -hmm. And I'm a big fan of uh, using groups to keep your your layer stack in good, clean condition. Yeah, no, those are really nice because when you have a, a complex retouching job or, or compositing job, you, your layers can multiply very quickly and having them in yeah. groups definitely helps kind of manage them and corral them. Bizarre that I'm so persnickety about that. Now, if you were to see my bedroom right now, it's a mess, but my layer, my, <laughs> my go into any of my Photoshop files and everything will be pers pristinely stacked yeah yeah no i know what you mean i know what you mean i i, I have the same challenge with my office sometimes you know? you're right yeah glad you guys can't see the my, chaos. my desktop right now well that was very cool carrie thank you for that that walkthrough and deconstruction of that file i i always find it as you mentioned earlier i think it's really useful to to take take a a stroll through other people's work and and see how they they did all of their work and uh made the magic happen yeah, I think it's always fascinating. I still like to look through every look through other people's Photoshop files. So you have, uh, I think you mentioned earlier, you have a workshop uh, coming up um, in the near future in, in New York City? Yes, I have one in April uh, at the School of Visual Arts. I don't actually know the, the dates right now, right offhand, but you can go to... Um, SVA's website and go to continuing education and just mm -hmm. look up my last name. Uh, just look up the teachers. And they, there's a, a form there you can put in B E E N E, my last name, Bean, and it will take you to my class. It's in April. It's a two day weekend workshop, intensive. You need to have uh, photo. So uh, in intensive on, on, on this, this sort of work we've been seeing here. Yeah, this, uh, the one that's coming up is the second of two. You do mm -hmm. not have to have gone to the first one. The first one is basically a beauty. Re uh, mm -hmm. But the, the, the second one next in April is beauty, but it's like you, you're going to do a, an entire beauty spread with the, the, the beauty, which is the headshot of the girl, a lifestyle, which is the full body of the girl, and a product, and sew them all together into a composite image. Cool. That sounds great. Yeah, it's pretty. Into I will, I, I'll find out what the uh, the link is and I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Oh, great. Thanks. Uh, and and then you also have a book called Real Retouching, a professional step by step guide. And uh, I'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. Fabulous. That's and, and what is and what's your uh, what's your website where people can find out more about you and see more examples of uh, your work? The website is carrynyc.com. Real simple. Okay, excellent. Well, we'll have a, a, a link there as well. So uh, cool, cool, excellent stuff. And I certainly picked up some stuff here. I mean, I knew I would because even though I know Photoshop fairly well, I do not do this sort of work on a regular basis. And whenever you talk to uh, somebody who does this sort of work day in, day out, you know, they've got all the cool, the cool techniques and tricks that they've learned through, you know, years of doing it as you have yeah 15 years of retouching i can't believe it wow wow well thank you so much for uh coming on and sharing some of that with us absolutely that was a lot of fun cool and thank you out there in internet land for tuning in and watching the fix uh remember you can always subscribe to the audio version on itunes or you can go to the website thisweekinphoto.com slash the fix to check out the video version. Uh, and there's also uh, an audio version you can download there as well. Obviously for certain uh, versions of the podcast, uh, the video version is good to see because there's lots of cool visuals on screen. Anyway, we will see you next week on another episode of The Fix. I'm Sean Duggan. Thanks for watching.